Now, it turns out that fossils aren't the only things in the fossil record, however, that allow us to reconstruct behavior. Over at least the last two to two and a half million years, humans have been good at accumulating trash. Basically, stone tools and other forms of material culture that also give us a window into human behavior. In some ways, they give us a very unique view into reconstructing human behavior, a view that we don't have for other kinds of fossil species. So we can interpret the function of stone tools in much the same way that we can interpret the function of fossils. We can look at the same kind of architectural features, the general shape, the function, the distribution of certain kinds of features as a way of reconstructing the behavioral patterns that they're indicative of. For example, if we look at this simple stone tool, this is simply a bifacially flaked chopper, basically a big cobble that's had a number of flakes knocked off of it. There's certain structural elements we can look at it to try and reconstruct behavior. First of all, its size, its weight, what kind of raw material it's made of, and then we can look at actually the kind of cutting edges that we've created. Each of these cutting surfaces are potentially indicative of what function this uh, object might have had. There are other kinds of analysis of archaeological materials that can tell us about behavior. For example, on this specimen that I previously showed, and this specimen, these Ashleyan hand axes, we can see that there's a similarity in terms of the overall shape of them. But one of the things that may not be obvious is what these edges were actually used for. One of the things we can do is what's referred to as use wear analysis, where we actually look at either chemical residues and or patterns of microscopic scratches along these edges to try and interpret what these were actually used for. What did these cutting surfaces actually cut? Did they cut through animal hide? Did they cut through plant surfaces? Or perhaps they cut through wood to make other kinds of tools that aren't durable and that aren't preserved in the fossil record. So archaeological materials can also supply an incredibly valuable insight into behavioral function in the fossil record. And this is true even when we look at later archaeological materials that aren't necessarily even constructed for functional purposes, but instead they reveal perhaps aspects of style or actually how cognitively individuals are thinking of the construction and the process of construction of cultural materials. In this case, it's giving us a much more uh, nuanced perspective into behavior, where it's not simply a matter of interpreting the function of this little figurine, but trying to understand what this figurine could have stood for and what the mind of the individual who created this figurine was envisioning in creating this structure. So archaeology provides an invaluable, although at times very nuanced, perspective of behavior through the fossil record. One additional way archaeology can inform our understanding of behavior is not through the physical objects themselves, but their distribution within an environment. We might find a lot of objects in one specific place and no objects in another area. We might find them distributed in a particular way within their environment. This distribution of materials can tell us something about how humans are moving throughout their environment, what they're doing in specific locations in their environment, how they're moving material from one place to another, or even how they're understanding their environment. As an example of this, you can think about how you interact with materials within your household. I know that I have a tendency to lose my keys and wallet. So I have a tendency to always keep those keys and wallet in a specific place very near the entryway to my house. That spatial distribution of materials within my house, is specifically the keys and wallet in this case, tells something about how I view my relationship to the house, to that space, to that environment, and my own behaviors within that. So we can use the distribution of archaeological materials to not only understand what organisms are doing, but potentially how they're envisioning their environment. As we move later into the human evolutionary record, this becomes important because humans begin to occupy broad areas of their environment and move throughout these environments in complex ways, across seasons and even across years. So thinking about the spatial distribution of archaeological materials within an environment provides us an important tool for understanding how humans were envisioning the environment they were occupying.